Prominent academic and author Dr. Michelle Chosodovsky warned that the so-called war on terrorism is a front to propagate America's global hegemony and create a new world order. He was speaking at the International Conference on the New World Order, Recipe for War or Peace. Dr. Chostovsky said terrorism is made in the U.S. and that terrorists are not the product of the Muslim world. According to him, the U.S. global war on terrorism was used to enact anti-terrorism laws that demonized Muslims in the Western world and created Islamophobia. Elaborating on his argument, Dr. Chostovsky said that NATO was responsible for recruiting members of the Islamic State, while Israel is funding global jihad elements inside Syria. Qaeda and the Al-Qaeda affiliated organizations, including the Islamic State, are not independent organizations. They are sponsored and they are sponsored by the United States and its allies. It is documented that prior to 2011, there was a process of recruitment of Mujahideen to fight in Syria. And this was coordinated by NATO and the Turkish High Command. This report is confirmed by Israeli news sources and unequivocally we are dealing with the state sponsorship of terrorism, the recruitment of mercenaries, uh, the training and the financing of terrorism. Uh, as much as possible, the United States has delegated its authority to other partners. Uh, despite the fact that ultimately this is an initiative of U.S. intelligence coordinated with the, the U.S. State Department and the Pentagon. My impression of your argument is that some Arab countries who are now engaged in the fight against ISIS earlier supported the rise of ISIS. Well, in any way, sir, you're fully aware that not only regional countries, some regional countries, but also some countries from outside our region were supporting various terrorist groups. The United States herself has been a supporter of them, and these types of supports have come in various forms, some financially, some with equipping, and some made their country the territory of their nations as a passageway to the field of battle, and some encouraged them in their domestic media and international media. All of them in one fashion or another um, encouraged and supported these terrorists. Whereas terrorism is always bad, without exceptions. You cannot say now it's good and another time condemn it. It is always bad and evil. Why would these governments support terrorism? Unfortunately, in the world of politics, uh, the understanding for some is such that when an objective becomes of paramount importance, for example, the toppling of a certain government becomes of utmost importance, then they allow themselves to use any means, any means in order to reach their own objective. Whereas these means, these tools can at a later point be used against them. You're suggesting that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey supported the terrorist because they wanted to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad. I did not name any countries, but be that as it may, it's your wish to uh, interpret that any way you wish. You're free to do so. There were numerous countries that, uh, with the government they were opposed to the government in Syria and were under the impression that by supporting these terrorists they would succeed in toppling that government. But obviously they were quite wrong in their calculus.
Travis J of what's going on in Syria with ISIS right now, everyone has opinions. Every world power has their opinion. Every news outlet has their opinion. Every hipster trying to sound impressive in every bar has an opinion. But you know whose opinion should count the most? The Syrians. That's whose. And they just took a poll that shed some light on what they think is going on. According to an Orb International poll, a whopping 81% of Syrians said they believe that ISIS is an American-made group. This isn't a country where leaflets are dropped from the sky, literally supporting America's Middle Eastern policy, mind you. They hear it all from everyone around the world all the time. Syrians have become the world's political pawns, and they're the ones suffering every day. They are the ones whose cities are being overtaken by ISIS. They're the ones whose sons are being beheaded, and their heads are used to decorate their park fences. These are the people who are actually living this nightmare full time, and a majority of them are now of the mind that this is America's fault. We've seen ISIS driving around in Humvees and Toyotas supplied by the U.S. We've seen them using American-made rifles. We know rebels who've received money from the American government have become top ISIS officials. A secret Pentagon report revealed that the U.S. not only foresaw the likely rise of ISIS as a result of its own foreign policy, but that it also saw the creation of ISIS as a strategic way to fight Assad. The Pentagon was very careful, at least we're told anyway, to vet people. The CIA gave anything, gave weaponry and training and everything else to anybody that would take it to do their bidding for them, okay? That's the difference there, and I think that those people... That we can go back to 2011 and 2012, the CIA working with the Muslim Brotherhood on the Syrian-Turkish border. We know that Reuters has reported it. Even Jonathan's paper over at The Guardian has reported this extensively. Collaboration between regional governments and terrorist elements inside of Syria, this fundamental point is what underlines the entire conflict in that country. From Turkish media network Canal D's highly successful TV show, Valley of the Wolves. It shows the exact same setup as the recent beheading videos from ISIS. So what is Turkey's connection to ISIS? Well, according to former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Hariri, the United States ran ISIS operations in Iraq out of its embassy in Ankara, Turkey. The plan to carve up Iraq and spark a regional war in the Middle East was masterminded by the Atlantic Council, according to Hariri. A source close to Hariri said the finishing touches were put on the balkanization plan during a George Soros-funded Atlantic Council Energy Summit held in Istanbul last November. The Benghazi-Turkey connection should be duly noted as well. In October, Business Insider reported Stephen's last meeting on September 11th was with Turkish Consul General Ali Said Akin. And a source told Fox News that Stevens was in Benghazi to negotiate a weapons transfer in an effort to get SA-7 missiles out of the hands of Libya-based extremists. This video was made months before the current wave of beheading videos leading us into Obama's unconstitutional war. I would like to bring up the policy of the Turkish government because the Turkish government, it has now been shown, it has come out publicly in Turkish courtrooms, it has come out in Turkish newspapers, that Turkey uh, and Turkish intelligence, the MIT, has been collaborating with the Al-Nusra Front and with some of the other uh, jihadist elements and terrorists and so-called rebels inside of Syria arming them. Public to fall for a false flag, mainstream media lies must be coordinated and complete. When the White House lied that Syria's government did the Damascus chemical attack, the entire mainstream media swallowed it whole without asking for a shred of evidence. Last month, U.S. intel admitted actually NATO member Turkey had false flagged the attack, which killed some 1,400 civilians to justify invasion. Not a single mainstream outlet reported it. Turkey's leaders banned YouTube last month after leaked audio of them planning another false flag to invade Syria, reportedly egged on by John Kerry. Turkey's premier confirmed the authenticity of the tape. I will send four men from Syria. I'll make up a cause of war by ordering a missile attack on Turkey. 
Many times, Kerry has said to me, OK, did you make the decision to strike? Mainstream as one coordinated a term of art that the Turks were just innocently, quote, discussing military strategy rather than the appalling truth that Turkey's planning a terrorist force flag on their own land as an excuse to invade Syria, apparently encouraged to commit the supreme international crime by the United States Secretary of State himself. We can cooperate with them regarding fighting the terrorism and making pressure on different countries like Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and some of their allies in Europe that supports the terrorists politically and financially and by military means. See that ISIS has come to a point where they have uh, taken control of the oil fields. They are selling the oil to none other than Turkey. They are making their own money as well. So first of all, why did Russia go there right now? Because it's a threat now to national security, to the homeland, to the Russian homeland, national security, number one. Number two, Russia has been talking to Saudi Arabia, the main supplier and the main aid for these armed groups for more than five years now. And it seems that... I just want to challenge I just want to challenge very quickly something that Fred is saying here. I think that he's making the argument that basically it is weakness that has caused this problem. It is weakness on the part of the United States. I would argue that it is a policy of supporting and arming and fomenting terrorism just as they did in Libya against Gaddafi using Al Qaeda affiliated terrorists, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, Akim uh, Belhaj, who is now leading Islamic State in Libya. They've done the same thing in Syria, arming terrorists in order to achieve an agenda by proxy, using terrorism as a proxy force. That is... How about Turkey? Uh, Turkey, let's say, is about Erdogan, his uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, fanatics. And Doesn't mean that he's a member, but he's a fanatic. President Erdogan is? He's a Muslim Brotherhood fanatic. And uh, he's uh, somebody who's suffering from political megalomania. And you think that he's becoming the sultan of the new era, of the 21st century. <laughs> points here and Jonathan's paper over at the Guardian covered this story extensively as did Arab media and a number of other outlets namely that the weapons that have been supplied by the United States into the hands of these so-called moderates have almost always gone into the hands of ISIS and on this refront oftentimes right after they receive them they simply move over and now call themselves the Islamic State or call themselves on Nusra or ally themselves with the Islamic Army of Conquest or any of these other factions so they present themselves as moderates and then he immediately overnight become jihadis. Who gave the United States the right to determine what is or is not a legitimate government in Syria? I mean, Arms and support are coming from the same sources. Source. They're coming from the U.S. and the Western powers anyway. So, I mean, the, the argument is moot because the weapons that go to the so-called moderates are the same weapons that go to the so-called Islamists. It's all coming from the same source. It's part of the same war. These phantom moderates, did you come across any of them? Because, you know, I turn on CNN and they must be, they're everywhere. They're all Jeffersonian Democrats, you know, and and John McCain knows them really well, but then in the real world, I don't see where they are. What President Obama said in one of his uh, interviews uh, recently, when he said that the moderate opposition in Syria is elusive. That's very clear by President Obama, and we always said there's no moderate opposition. So the rise of ISIS wasn't sudden again. The evisceration, the uh, uh, amputation, uh, eating the hearts of the victims started from the very beginning and even beheading started from the very beginning of the conflicts. It started what they called the moderate opposition, then it, it continued with al-Nusra, then with ISIS. So We've got the Syrian army on the ground already, why not help them to defeat ISIS? They're doing the best they can and uh, they're, the, they're the best bet. Okay. Eric, but that's there's, too, there's that's a reason too, why they that's won't too do logical. That. That's too easy. That's too simple, and it would resolve things. I mean, you could bring these people to a table. We could get this taken care of, wind this down quickly. But no, the bad actors in the region, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf countries, the United States, Israel, all the bad actors there, they don't want what happened. What we heard from Jonathan. Eric.
That's right, because ultimately the agenda is geopolitical in nature. This has nothing to do with simply trying to find a solution. It's not even just about regime change in Syria. It is about a geopolitical agenda where they want to break the alliance that exists between Iran and now Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah, the uh, crescent of Shia power, the Shia alliance, which is not a purely sectarian one, but one that is strategic in nature. The United States wants to destroy that, and it wants its regional allies to help in destroying that and part of the reason why they can't let go of this regime change scenario or regime change strategy is because they want to break that alliance they want to sever Hezbollah from Iran they want to carve up the region and they understand the Islamic State and Sunni extremism generally speaking is the principal bulwark uh, and principal vehicle by which they're able to achieve that strategy and so it's Do you think it's a politically influenced uh, issue? Do you think it's a sectarian issue? Or do you think it's just something that's theological? Of course, uh, countries and states will exploit any problem to further their foreign agendas. You see a country like uh, Turkey has allowed access to ISIS to move into Syria and Iraq. Even the Western countries um, whether they wish to admit it or not. Let me begin with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an uh, anarchic autocracy, medieval system that's based on the Wahhabi dark ideology. Actually, they say it's a marriage between the Wahhabi and the political system for 200 years now. That's how we look at it. And what is their connection to ISIS? The same ideology, the same background. So ISIS and Saudi Arabia are one and the same? The same ideology, yes. Same ideology. Ideology, it's Wahhabi ideology. They base, uh, their ideology is based on the books of the Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. So you believe that all Wahhabis have the same ideology as yeah. ISIS? Exactly, definitely. And that's known by ISIS, by Al-Qaeda, by Al-Nusra. It's not something we discover or we, we, we try to promote. It's very, uh, I mean, their book, they use the same books to indoct indoctrinate the people. Now, as Roosevelt sat waiting for Abdulaziz, no one could possibly have imagined the consequences of this meeting. For it was going to unleash forces that in the future would undermine everything that Roosevelt had worked for. His belief that politicians should use their power in a planned way to reshape the world. But Roosevelt knew that to keep that power, America needed oil. And he wanted to forge an alliance with the king to make sure that the vast Saudi oil fields remain under American control. In their conversation, the two men laid the foundations for an alliance that continues to the present day. America would get its oil, and in return, Saudi Arabia would receive wealth and security from America. But the king was well aware of the dangers of opening up his country to the influence of the modern West. And in the negotiations that followed, he laid down a condition. We will take your technology and your money, he said, but you must leave our faith alone. The Saudi faith was called Wahhabism. It was a radical, violent, and extremely puritanical form of Islam. Great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, His Majesty King Salman uh, to the Oval Office. This is uh, the latest of several meetings that I've had uh, with His Majesty, and uh, the fact that he has chosen to take this uh, first visit to the United States uh, is indicative of the long standing friendship between the United States and Saudi Arabia.
the New World Order runs Al-Qaeda. Saudi Arabia is in the middle of it. They've been promised the entire Middle East. It is unprecedented. A Saudi prince has been detained in the Lebanese capital of Beirut at Rafi Kariri International Airport after it was discovered that he was carrying two tons of methamphetamine captagon as well as some cocaine as he attempted to travel from Lebanon back to Saudi Arabia. Now what's alarming about this case is that the drug captagon has been famously used by ISIS fighters and is being seen as some kind of a fuel for the rampage by ISIS through Syria and Iraq. And so Margaret, it does beg the question, with the sheer amount of drugs involved, this captagon being found on this Saudi prince in this kind of a number, uh, does that mean that there is a connection between Saudi Arabia and the fuel for ISIS? Wahhabism is the origin, is the mother of all these terrorist groups. If you read the literature of these groups, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and all these groups, you will find that they are following Ibn Taymiyyah. Recently, I have seen an article written in one of the websites of ISIS trying to defend the ISIS killing of people. And they said, we are not doing anything new. They brought the history of the first Wahhabi government of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And how he used to kill everyone else. So they say that as he established an Islamic state by killing all those who opposed him and were different from him, we are doing the same. We are not doing anything new. So Wahhabism is the mother of all these terrorist groups. The real rebels trying to overthrow Assad are Al-Qaeda, that's, that's Reuters, and the Russians just blew them up. <laughs> Now, Russia's bombing, who supposedly blew up our towers on 9-11 and killed all of our Americans, and we had to give up all our rights because of it, and Russia is being attacked all over its southern belly by these very same people that our U.S. government trained on record. Our own military knows this and is speaking out and saying no. The former head of defense intelligence went public two months ago, as you know. Well, who on earth armed them? Who helped to arm the Syrians that were fighting against Assad? Who created the necessary political climate that facilitated the situation? Who pushed for the delivery of arms to the area? Do you really not understand as to who is fighting in Syria?